Okay, so I was given 20 minutes to talk about this particular topic, inclusive entrepreneurship, and I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, how do I do that in 20 minutes? And, and I'm not any expert, despite uh, the, the glowing introduction I've received. I think many of you in, in this room are probably the subject matter experts on entrepreneurship and making sure that you have the widest range of the best people uh, putting forth the greatest ideas that can change the world. So let's, uh, let's take it from there. Um, I'm, I'm going to start off with some, some bad news first, is that okay? And then I'm going to get you going and I'm going to make you happier. Um, so first of all, we, we know that the City of Toronto is booming. I think we can all recognize that. But booming for some people and not for all. For the, next, for the past 35 years, there's a particular demographic and there's three subsets that are not seeing their wages go up. Their wages have been stagnated, their, their earning potential has been stagnated at 1980 levels. Uh, and that is uh, immigrants, this particular group, racialized people and, uh, and, and young people. Um, so we recognize that yes, there are all sorts of uh, indicators out there that tell us that Toronto is on the move. We've got Elevate here, we've got Collision, we're becoming the Silicon Valley of the North. All those things are fantastic if you want to just open your eyes to see that portion of the city. But we also recognize that the city is becoming increasingly polarized around uh, income disparity. And this is something we cannot ignore. And it's also divided along the lines of, of race, uh, immigration status, and oftentimes around age. So despite the fact that we have uh, great uh, uh, employment numbers, uh, the jobs that are being created are precarious. Uh, they are not well paid. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, this is what we now call the gig economy, um, which people are rallying to, uh, oftentimes around tech platforms, but it is utterly not sustainable. And we're seeing labor market uh, forces um, sort of come to bear. And, and what we're also seeing is that they're not able to sort of match up to the power of, uh, of, the, of, of corporate uh, global wealth and, uh, and all the tsunami that's coming. Um, so who's poor? You don't have to put up your hands, just a rhetorical question. <laughs> If you, if you choose to self-identify, that's okay too. But this is a particular um, interesting chart for me. There's lots of charts out there. You could pull them off Google image anytime you want. Um, just make sure you credit it. I credit Vital Signs Toronto Foundation. The people who are poor in this city are, are those that you probably know who are poor. But I just want to highlight this because we're, if we're going to talk about inclusive entrepreneurship, we need to talk about who's included and who's not. And clearly we, we recognize that there's some sensitivity, not in this room, but whenever I talk about whiteness and white males, like people get upset. <laughs> it's almost like it doesn't exist, but at the same time, if we don't look at that, we're never going to be able to unpack what the problems are. And these problems are systemic. They are historical. Um, they have uh, deep challenges for many of these communities. Uh, when it comes to racialized people and, uh, and immigrants in particular, they make about 69 cents on the male dollar. And, and that number falls dramatically uh, lower if you happen to be a black uh, person, black woman, as well as an indigenous person. There isn't a lot of information around trans people, but I suspect those numbers are also quite uh, low. Um, so Toronto now has this, I mean, you've heard about the economist titles of, you know, being the tech uh, capital of the North, Hollywood North, these are where all the jobs are co co being concentrated, but we're also the working poor capital of Canada. We have the highest child care rates uh, in the country. We have, we are also sadly the child uh, poverty uh, uh, sort of uh, leader in, in our nation, only next to um, Winnipeg, and those are not necessarily the, um, the announcements that the mayor will stand at a podium like this to make, um, but there are also things that are grappling um, very deeply at the heart of the city and it is not getting better unless we turn the ship around. Let's talk about Indigenous communities for a bit. Um, for people who are Indigenous living in Toronto, I'm told never to put a slide up with lots of text, but I couldn't really avoid doing this one and this might be one of three that you're going to see. Um, this is a very bleak picture for Indigenous people living in Toronto. Um, just, I mean, the stats are, are quite compelling. As you can see, 63% are unemployed compared to the Ontario average of 7%. Uh, you have 87% living 
below the poverty line, and about a third of them are already precariously housed uh, or have experienced some form of homelessness in their lives. So I think that if we're going to be talking about reconciliation, if we're going to be talking about uh, building a country that's going to be inclusive of in Canada's first uh, people, the Indigenous people, uh, Métis, Inuit, then we're going to have to address these particular stats. And this requires intentional investments. It, in, in, it requires us unpacking the colonial history that we are all part of, which we now own together. Uh, and it actually includes us tracking the, pro, uh, the progress. Um, so I wanted to highlight this in particular, and, and Dr. Suke mentioned uh, about the Indigenous Center for Innovation Entrepreneurship, and I will get to that. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why people don't succeed. And even as women are sort of being encouraged to join boards, women are being encouraged to uh, participate in, uh, in entrepreneurship and, uh, and thought leadership in the, st in the, f uh, in the subject uh, fields of STEM. Uh, what we do know is that when women do attend those conferences or, make, or take up those spaces, uh, is that 25% of the women will report some form of sexual harassment. So the culture is going to have to change. And if you've all, and we recognize that also, Toronto is actually moving into that space where we want to become premier uh, meeting spaces. We want to host these massive, like we're talking about 10,000 people descending upon the city from around the world, oftentimes bringing the culture that they have uh, back home in the cities that they're working in into the city. And amazingly, that mashup is the same. It doesn't matter where you go. 41% of women say that they want to go back to those conferences and those tech spaces because they had 25% of them had some of a bad experience. And those who didn't necessarily report that, they're still saying, you know what, I'm not sure if it's for me. So of course we see women graduating in record numbers in STEM in, in the history of, of uh, recording those, uh, uh, that information, but they're also leaving the field if they actually don't have access uh, to safe spaces that are free from discrimination, free from harassment. So coming back to what happens with the Indigenous community, I think one thing that we need to recognize is that we are not not going to be able to tackle any of the challenges that we have at the City of Toronto unless we can actually get to the core of those issues. And the challenges for us at the City is that we have incredible global ambassadors who've all chosen Toronto to be their home. My goodness, we've got 240 neighborhoods. We speak over 140 languages. Like we have connections here to the global economy. We should be investing in our people and those people that oftentimes that get overlooked are the ones that don't get access to funding. So don't get access to capital. And we take a look at where the social capital dollars going, where the startup venture capital dollars are going, they're not necessarily going to uh, people of color, they're not going to immigrants, and they're certainly not always going to young people, and, uh, and in particular, women. Um, I, I come back to truth and reconciliation a bit because it's actually on my mind. Um, we have a responsibility here as Canadians to actually do right by, I think, um, the population that, uh, that, that, that has been here first. And one of the, the fastest ways and probably one of the most prominent ways of actually helping Indigenous people in Canada is specifically around a recommendation that came out of the Truth and Reconciliation Call to Actions. Um, and it specifically talked about investments in entrepreneurship in businesses and startups. We spend a lot of time talking about social services, heck of a lot of time. And we talk about poverty reduction at the city, and right now the city is being criticized in one of the right-wing tabloid newspapers about spending about $181 million on poverty reduction strategies. A lot of it is about reinforcing that social safety net. Although it is important, I would argue, and I think that you might agree, uh, because you're here about this particular subject matter, is that we need to also make sure that people have opportunities to succeed where they can. So for example, we have vertical communities that are, live, that are uh, oftentimes exposed to extreme poverty, but some of the mo th those individuals are actually are, are entrepreneurs. Uh, I represent communities, uh, three of them, that have the poor census track in Toronto Center, you're in my neighborhood right now, Toronto Center as a, as a riding or a ward. St. Jamestown, 
Regent Park and Moss Park. You know them because you walk through these areas. They make the newspapers all the time, not necessarily for the good news stories, but oftentimes around the violence, around lateral violence, around homelessness, around despair, around gun violence, uh, and you, you name it, we usually wear those banners. Um, I've also recognized that they're the home of the most resilient people of I I've actually ever met. Uh, you give them a, a dime, they'll turn that into a dollar and they'll stretch it all the way. They are making shift businesses everywhere, whether it's uh, home enterprises that are oftentimes being cranked out of their tiny little TCHC one-bedroom um, uh, apartments, and they're, they're selling and, and, and offering on-site and off-site catering services, uh, or they have sewing collectives, uh, and if you actually elevate uh, the, the work of basic sewing into fabric arts, into fine craft, you start moving into the contemporary world of arts, which is where Wendy and I first interacted. So I know oftentimes being able to sort of shift that dial to a language that, uh, that can actually give their products more value and to allow them to export and, and scale up, uh, this is something that can be done because the power in the communities are already there. They just don't have access to facilities. They don't oftentimes have access to capital. And for a lot of folks who are living in poverty, are especially uh, the children of single parent-led households, and oftentimes they are women, uh, they need access to affordable childcare. And until those things change, those basic conditions, a lot of it we are stuck with. Um, the City of Toronto is, is trying to do a job. Uh, I would say we haven't fully wrapped our brains around making the connections uh, intersect in the way that actually will give us the outcomes. And I'm not just talking about outputs. I'm talking about making sure that the results are going to give us a path out of poverty, allow people who are probably going to fall into social harm, which means they won't finish uh, high school or post-secondary. We want to give them a pathway to education as well. Um, I've Tor Toronto's indigenous population is estimated around 35 to 74,000 people. Depends on who you who speak to. Uh, indigenous communities locally will identify that that's probably their demographic. Um, interestingly enough, that number is three times higher uh, than what uh, Statistics Canada has reported for the city of Toronto. Um, can you imagine being so far off the mark? Um, and yet. We're not necessarily investing, investing in, this, in this particular group, not in the way that I think that can yield us much higher returns. Um, so this is actually in your neighborhood. This is at 200 Dundas Street uh, East, right at the corner of George Street and Dundas. It's that little nook of the street where um, Dun Dundas sort of bends. And right now you could probably see a couple of condominiums going up. Um, we're building the world's largest business incubator uh, for indigenous people. This is going to be 26,000 square feet. Uh, it is over three stories now. It used to be, used, just so you know, where I started the negotiations with the developer, it was 12,000 square feet. And over the years, because it's taken so long to build this building, I thought every year I'd go and ask for more space. And somehow it's worked out. Um, <laughs> but this is, the, this is the, the, the challenge, is that as we were interviewing and, and consulting with Indigenous groups, um, it was very difficult to nail down what type of business hub do they want us to create. And we want to co-create this with them. So we were moving very slowly, asking a lot of questions, asking them to lead us to where we, we, we thought we should go based on the reconciliation. Uh, recommendations, but at the same time, um, we wanted to make sure that the leadership was going to be driven by Indigenous people. The things that we learned uh, was that, uh, number one, there is no one-size-fits-all. Trying to create one center for Indigenous population is not going to be uh, highly specialized in one field or the other. So we talked about virtual reality, augmented reality. Can we actually uh, work with the rural communities? Can we bring uh, the learnings uh, into an urban urban center? Setting. Can we then monetize it? Can we scale it up? People who are coming from around the world, can they land in Toronto and go straight here if they want to do business with the Indigenous community? And the answer to all that is yes, but not exclusively. And so the, the, the th things that we have learned is that we have to be able to work in collaboration with communities to meet them where they are. So this, this lesson can be taken anywhere. 
whether it's Thorncliff, Regent Park, St. Jamestown, Malvern, uh, Jane and Finch, uh, as long as we're able to meet people where they are and give them access to facilities, because space came up as one major thing that people needed in order for them to do the work. It, we talk about ecosystems a lot, a lot in this sector. The ecosystems look very differently to many different people. Uh, so we needed to be able to unpack what does this ecosystem look like? Will it look like Mars? Will it look like on-ramp, the city of Toronto, the University of Toronto's facility there? Uh, will it look like uh, the Center for Social Innovation? We looked at all these different models. We went all the way to uh, to take a look at what was, and I didn't, I didn't travel there, but we looked uh, into uh, what was happening in New Zealand, which has a very strong and indigenous population there with the Ma Maori population. And they were doing things already way and far more advanced than we've ever thought we could. And even far, much further advanced than what they're doing in British Columbia, which which is always seen as their, sort of the, the, the top uh, bench level um, when it comes to indigenous entrepreneurship and innovation in Canada. And so one thing we've learned is that we don't have the answers, but in order for us to make it a space that indigenous people will want to do business in, that we're going to meet them where they are, it's going to have to reflect their, their voice and their vision. So we are going to be opening this, uh, this facility in 2020. For those of you who work in this space, we welcome you. Anybody can be a member. You don't have to be an Indigenous entrepreneur, uh, but you will have to pay more by way of membership than those who are Indigenous identified. Uh, and that's okay, right? So what we've seen is we've already had interest from Van City in Vancouver. We've had interest in Twitter, Slack technology. Everybody wants to know what the heck we're doing. They all seem to want a piece of this action. The one thing I'm interested in, in doing is can we document our history and our journey here, journal, journal the heck out of it, make sure we study it for the next three years to make sure we figure out what went wrong, how to pivot very quickly if we fail so we actually will pick ourselves up and keep on going, but can we export this? I'm fascinated by the concept of exportability, and can we bring this to urban centers across Canada? Because this will be the uh, largest Indigenous business incubator in the world. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Uh, we, we recognize this, um, but certainly we're, we're also very much aware of the fact that, you know, if it is successful, can we build an Indigenous district? So the district could be um, a top tourist destination in Toronto. And again, I take this as an example that you can actually build this in almost any community based on the strengths of the people that are there. So therefore, no visit in Toronto is complete without a visit to Young Street, my favorite street. It could be uh, the CN Tower. It could be Toronto's waterfront. Interestingly enough, the number one tourist destination in Toronto is the Eaton Centre. Oh. This happens to be a seven-minute walk from the Eaton Centre. So therefore, no visit to Toronto is complete without visiting Canada's first Indigenous business and cultural district. And so can we make this much bigger than it is by starting with just a little um, concept of an idea? It needs money. It needs people power. Without the people, it just won't work. Um, but we recognize that that's part of the equation. Toronto, I'm, I'm a city official, so I'm going to give it the plug. Um, and, you know, we, we talk a lot about Toronto being this, this incredible city that's gonna, that has everything, but we've also identified the fact that we've got some, some weak spots and we need to be able to address this. But if we actually leverage these strengths and put an equity lens over it, an equity lens that actually incorporates gender and the intersectional complexities that come with gender, we should be investing in, in our people in ways that are going to yield us those returns. And this is one of the challenges that I have at the City of Toronto. The budget is the apex of every single policy uh, tool, apex. You can't have strategies and plans without a budget item that's attached to it. One of the, str one of the failings I believe that we have, and I don't have the answers, and I hope that this, this you know, I come to you in front of you very humbly because I don't have the answers. One of the challenges that we have is that we haven't exactly tied these things together. So whether it's plans or strategies that don't have budgetary uh, actions to it to operationalize, it just won't work. So we can have all sorts of documents that are talking about our vision, invest in people, in the ideas that will make the world better, great, awesome. I really do think that does sound good, looks good on a t-shirt, I want to hashtag that. However, 
if we don't actually put the money into the communities that are most desperately falling behind, we're not going to be able to get to where we are. So that means that we actually should be scaling up the enterprises we have in Regent Park, which includes uh, sewing collectives. Uh, we should be actually investing in the Thorncliffe communities, which are oftentimes led by single uh, women in these, in these households. And can they build a catering collective? Then they go into private label. Then they go into special sauces. You know where I'm going. Then all of a sudden, it's, it's sitting at Whole Foods, because um, if, if President's Choice can take all of the best things of the world that are sitting right here in Toronto and private label and turn it their, to their own, why can't the communities that actually created that special sauce? do it for themselves if they had access to facilities and money and the markets, right? This is all doable because somebody else is already doing it and it's not the communities that have actually produced the creativity and the wealth. Um, Arturo Di Madico, he actually dropped the, the raging bull, the 7,000 pound bronze bull, uh, as a give back to, um, to America. The, you know, the American dream, the land of opportunities. He has so much, he has so much to give back to, to the country of who, who, who adopted him. Uh, and he wanted to show the prosperity and strength of, of, the, of, the, car, of the country. It, it happened to land on Wall Street, and it, be, it sort of took on a life of its own. It's like the, the, the raging strength of Wall Street and the markets. It happened to have been installed two years after the, uh, the, the global collapse of 87, when Bank of America went belly up and all those things. They've recovered a bit. Um, and then in, two, in 1917, no, sorry, in 2017, um, another artist was actually, she was actually commissioned to do this work, and her name is Kristen Visbal. Uh, and she was commissioned by straight, uh, st sorry, State Street Global Advisors uh, to actually build the statue. It's four feet tall, so it's not very big. And it's, it was in commemoration of the Year of the Girl, right? So they happen to have put, put these two structures together and they juxtapose them. Um, and I think that it took on a world of meaning of its own. Uh, interestingly enough, the Sicilian artists decided that, you know what, you're taking away from my art. And I don't disagree because, you know, it, he, it was his placement first. He curated the space. He knew exactly where he wanted it. And so he actually wanted to set up a, a statement. So I don't want to take anything away from the fact that he said, you've, you've placed the artwork too close to mine. Now you've changed the context. <laughs> it is it is an entirely legitimate art argument in the art world. right? So that's why you have to curate these group exhibitions carefully. Um, and this was not curated. It was sort of self-organized. So uh, there was there was protest from the artists. And the, the advisors from State Street said, you know what? You're absolutely right. So they've then moved this this uh, bronze statue of this fearless little girl. She's got her own hashtag, fearless girl. And they moved her in front of the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> and I thought, how absolutely befitting. Because really what she wanted to do, what, what they really wanted to do originally with the statue was to highlight the, um, uh, to be quite honest, to highlight uh, the, the fact that we needed more women on boards. Great. Absolutely. But I would argue that we probably need more women, more diverse women, more diverse people everywhere. Boards are one thing, but those board spaces aren't always going to be welcoming. And those board spaces also mean that you're not probably going to be able to, not everyone can be, uh, can launch themselves into the C-suite immediately. And, and we recognize that. Um, so. The world is, is possible with changes, and how we come to take a look at the situations that we're in is entirely up to us as well. So I want to leave you with this because although I don't have all the answers, I don't think any of us in the room do, but if we crowdsource this all together, we'll probably get to a solution that says we have to bring forward the best ideas and to invest in those people, but we also need to make sure that we do it strategically to the outcome that we're looking for. And that's it. Thank you very much.